The study of our ancient past is filled with enduring mysteries. But among the greatest is a question of cognition. In the battle for the planet, who was truly the more intelligent hominin, the Neanderthal or the early modern human? For over a century, the Neanderthal's massive brain size has challenged the simple narrative of our own species' cognitive superiority. Were they simply a less developed ancestor or a differently adapted intelligence? This exploration of the fossil evidence allows us to reconstruct these two very different minds, forcing a re-examination of one of history's greatest intellectual showdowns. This re-examination begins with the most fundamental piece of anatomical evidence, a fact that has long contradicted the simple story of our species' inevitable rise. A bigger brain seems like it should mean more intelligence, but did it for Neanderthals? That question has puzzled researchers for decades, because when their skulls were first measured and compared to ours, the results were not what most people expected. Neanderthals didn't have small brains. On average, in fact, their cranial capacity slightly exceeded that of modern humans, hovering around 91 cubic inches compared to our 82 cubic inches. This created an obvious paradox. If size alone equaled mental power, then why didn't Neanderthals dominate the evolutionary stage in the long term? The fossil record shows a striking pattern. Endocranial volumes, the measurable space inside the skull, varied widely in both groups. Some Neanderthal brains were larger than any known early modern human from the same period, but there was also overlap. As Ralph Holloway argued in Evolution of the Human Brain, brain volume alone cannot serve as a scoreboard for intelligence. Two skulls with similar capacity may house very different types of minds. Neubauer and colleagues later reinforced this point, showing that modern humans developed a more globular cranial shape, while Neanderthals retained the elongated skulls. The difference suggested not just a matter of size, but of how the brain was organized inside. To understand why, think about engines. You can build a car with a massive motor, but if the design is inefficient or tuned for the wrong purpose, it doesn't guarantee speed or versatility. Neanderthals were indeed built differently. Their skeletons reveal strong, stocky frames adapted for cold climates. A larger body requires more neural resources, extra brain matter dedicated to muscle control, motor coordination, and vision. Pierce, Stringer, and Dunbar argued that Neanderthals' enlarged eye sockets meant a larger share of their brain was already devoted to processing visual input. In other words, much of their mental real estate was locked into keeping the body running, rather than freeing capacity for abstract thought. Modern humans, by contrast, had lighter builds and narrower torsos, which meant fewer resources were required for bodily maintenance. That freed up space for other functions, not in cubic inches, but in distribution. Pereira Pedro et demonstrated that modern humans had relatively larger parietal lobes, regions linked to imagination, tool innovation, and symbolic thought. Kochiyama and colleagues found that modern humans also had proportionally larger cerebellar hemispheres, supporting language, learning, and working memory. These differences suggest that early modern human brains were wired for flexibility, abstraction, and social integration. The outcomes reflect this architecture. Neanderthals survived for hundreds of millennia, but their toolkits changed slowly and cultural expression remained limited. Modern humans, meanwhile, produced rapid innovations, layering knowledge across generations. The paradox resolves when you see that intelligence isn't measured in cubic volume, but in how functions are distributed and integrated. Neanderthals had the size, but humans had the wiring. Globular brains tuned for abstraction, planning, and social connection. And that difference set the stage for which lineage would endure. Imagine two skulls resting side by side. One is long and slightly flattened in profile, while the other appears rounder, almost ballooned out along the sides and back. This difference in shape, elongated versus globular, may have made all the difference between a species that endures only in the fossil record and one that spread across every continent. Researchers such as Philip Guntz and colleagues have shown that shape, not just size, distinguishes the brains of modern humans from those of Neanderthals. 
In this sense, shape is not cosmetic. It defines which regions can grow, how they connect, and the capacities that emerge from inside. When early modern human fossils are studied, an intriguing pattern appears. Some of the earliest skulls show faces recognizable as modern, with flatter profiles and smaller brows. But the brain cases tell another story. They lack the signature roundness of present-day humans, revealing that our body shape and our brain shape did not modernize at the same rate. The face evolved first, yet the brain case was still catching up. Neubauer's 2018 study documented this lag, showing that cranial globularity increased only gradually over the past 100,000 years. Our distinct neural potential did not arrive fully formed, but emerged step by step. Neanderthals, on the other hand, never took that step. Their cranial vaults remained elongated. Archaeologists consistently find them stretched from front to back, never achieving the rounded form seen in later modern humans. This static pattern contrasts with our evolutionary trajectory, which moved through at least two main phases of change. These shifts produced what researchers now call globularity, marked by bulging of the parietal portions at the sides, expansion of the cerebellar regions at the base, and a rearrangement of interior space. Pereira Pedro confirmed that parietal regions in modern humans are proportionally larger than in Neanderthals, a subtle anatomical shift with profound cognitive implications. Globularity brought several linked advantages. The parietals, which integrate spatial awareness and mental imagery, grew outward, opening room for more complex maps of self and environment. The cerebellum, often seen as only a motor coordinator, gained relative volume. Kochiyama showed that modern humans had larger cerebellar hemispheres, which now support language processing, learning, and working memory. Internal pathways also reorganized, creating greater connectivity. Rather than functioning in isolated compartments, brain regions could share information more dynamically, a foundation for flexible thought. A critical part of this transformation involved Grohom, growth after birth. Neubauer's team demonstrated that human infants undergo a unique globularization phase in the first year of life, during which the skull rounds out and white matter connections multiply. Neanderthal endocasts, by contrast, show rapid early growth but retain elongation, suggesting their neural wiring set more quickly into fixed channels. Timing proved as important as size, extended plasticity in human infants left more opportunity for experience to shape developing networks. You can picture the contrast like two rooms. One is a long hall, spacious but narrow, with doors far apart. The other is a rotunda, where walls curve and connect across multiple angles. The second allows more shortcuts and interactions. Likewise, the globular human brain created an internal landscape of broader networks, opening the path to abstract reasoning, working memory, and symbolic culture. The elongated Neanderthal brain, for all its volume, operated within a chamber less suited for cross-linking. Fossils show this shift did not occur overnight. Between about 100,000 and 35,000 years ago, skulls transition from intermediate to fully globular forms. This timeline parallels the archaeological record. The rise of more complex toolkits, symbolic artifacts, and cumulative cultural traditions Globularization offered no guaranteed advantage, but it scaffolded opportunities. With parietals, cerebellum, and white matter connectivity reorganized, modern humans could transform knowledge into culture and imagination into survival strategies. Neanderthals remained capable survivors, but the architectural divergence gave our lineage the enduring edge. What if the secret to language, memory, and planning lay in two hidden brain regions Neanderthals never fully expanded? The clue sits in the parietal lobes and the cerebellum, areas not as obvious as the massive frontal forehead arc we usually picture when we think of intelligence, but no less decisive. These parts may have carried the real difference between day-to-day -day survival and the deeper ability to project into the future. The parietal lobe is positioned near the top and back of the brain, bridging input from vision, touch, and body position. Its role goes far beyond simple mapping. It allows you to form a mental model of where you are in space, helps track objects as they shift around you, 
and supports concepts that only exist in the mind, like numbers, distance, or imagined movement. Think of it as a flexible grid where raw perception turns into structured thought. Humans show a particular bulging in this region, with landmarks called the angular and supramarginal gyri projecting more prominently than in Neanderthal skulls. These expansions are linked with advanced visuospatial reasoning and abstract integration. When someone envisions a tool before making it, or pictures a hunt unfolding in several steps before acting, the parietals come online. For modern humans, this expansion opened the possibility of placing oneself not just inside a present situation, but inside an imagined one. Neanderthals, with less developed parietal areas, probably managed their world in a more immediate, practical way. For example, consider stone tools. Both species could chip and shape rock, but humans seem to have refined smaller, more standardized blades. Crafting precision tools requires an ability to visualize symmetrical forms and execute fine adjustments guided by mental templates, skills strongly tied to parietal processing. The same region also handles symbolic manipulation, something like numbers. While Neanderthals likely had a sense of quantity, the abstract layering we associate with counting systems would have drawn heavily on this expanded parietal capacity. Another outlet of this region is self-representation. Humans construct intricate models of the self in relation to others, even imagining how they might look through another's eyes. That perspective shifting, essential to advanced social behaviors and language, connects to the angular gyrus in ways that Neanderthal anatomy does not appear to match. The difference in size, subtle on the skull surface, plays out in the scope of cognition it allows. But the parietals were not the only decisive region. The cerebellum, tucked beneath the back of the brain, provided another upgrade. Traditionally, it was associated only with balance and smooth movement. Yet modern studies show it handles far more. It fine-tunes sequences, regulates timing, and supports learning patterns, all of which matter for speech, memory, and even abstract thought. Without well-tuned sequences, fluent language falls apart. Here lies one of the most striking contrasts. Despite their large overall brains, Neanderthals had proportionally smaller cerebellar regions. This suggests that while they managed motor control well enough, they likely carried less capacity for the kind of layered reprocessing that language and cultural ritual demand. Executive functions, working memory, shifting attention, adapting to changing tasks, depend heavily on cerebellar support. Humans with expanded cerebellums could juggle more ideas in the mind at once, keep them updated, and reorganize them when plans shifted. To add to this, genetic evidence points to regulatory differences affecting how neural circuits formed. Mutations linked with modern humans influence how cortical layers and language networks develop. One well-known example is regulatory variation around the FOXP2 gene, which plays a role in speech and motor sequencing. While both Neanderthals and humans carried FOXP2, the surrounding control elements in our lineage seem to have driven more flexible expression. That subtle genetic change likely added fine-tuning to speech rhythms and learning abilities, capacities that could make or break communication over distance or across generations. When you put these details together, the pattern sharpens. Early modern humans were not simply inheritors of a slightly larger thought engine. Their brain regions were tuned differently, parietals spaced for abstraction and self-models, a cerebellum geared to sequences and symbols, and supporting genes that refined learning potential. These differences created a neural package optimized to imagine, plan, and unify knowledge through culture. That distinct combination opened the door for symbolic language, long-term maps of memory, and the ability to plot several steps ahead. Neanderthals were intelligent, skilled, and capable, but their brains emphasized different strengths. They had size, resilience, and focus. Humans had shape, coordination, and cross-linking. With size, shape, and regions weighed against each other, the next question lingers. Were humans truly smarter by every measure, or were they simply better adapted to the kind of world that rewarded networks and symbols over sheer strength of mind? Neanderthals carried the size, but humans carried the blueprint. Structure, shape, and in timing came together in a way that changed cognition itself. Our species gained a rounded brain case, 
expanded parietals, and a more active cerebellum, and those details added up to networks capable of linking thought across domains. Smarter then is not just raw capacity. The edge lies in linking abilities together. Tools with symbols, memory with planning, speech with imagination. So how do you define intelligence, sharper isolated skills, or a brain wired for connection? Let us know in the comments what you think made us truly distinct.